Hello, and welcome to The Content Advantage, a talk show about content for content professionals. I'm Scott Abel, and joining me today is my co-host, Megan Gohuli. Hey, Scott. How are you doing? Great. Nice to see you, Megan. You too. You too. We are ready to take on another episode of The Content Advantage, and I want to start by introducing our esteemed guest. He's an information architect and content strategy guru, as well as author. This is Alan J. Porter. Thanks so much for joining us today, Alan. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, Scott. Thanks for inviting me on the show. It's great to be here. And uh, it, it's been a while since you and I have talked together, and uh, it, it's it's fun to be able to do it. Yeah, again. it's been too long. Very nice. I'm, I'm yeah. so glad we're here today. All right, before we get started, let me tell the audience members who may have not uh, joined one of our shows before a few things. First of all, the show's being recorded. So uh, if you want to leave a little early or you need to skedaddle out of here, don't worry. You're going to be able to catch up later. We'll send you a link to the recording that you can use at any time to watch the show on demand. You can even share that link with others. Also, we can't see or hear you, so you don't have to worry about your camera or microphone. We have no access to those devices. At any time, you can ask a question of Alan by using the Ask a Question tab located underneath your webinar viewing panel. That'll open up a little chat area where you'll be able to text us a question. We won't be able to text you back, so just be aware of that. And there's additional content available uh, for you, including some handouts from our sponsor of today's show and some contact information and other details about Alan J. Porter, our today's guest. So don't forget to check out the attachments section before you leave today's show. Great. All right, let's dive in. So Alan, we want to hear about you. Can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and your connection to today's topic? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been in the content business oh, 30 plus years now. That makes me feel really old. Um, yeah. When did those, when did the 1980s get so far away? Um, so yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I started in tech doc in 1980s. My first uh, job was actually writing technical manuals for Concord, which probably even dates me even more, but it was a cool, wow. way, to, cool way to start my career. Um, and ended up running a very large technical documentation group for a uh, aerospace company um, and sort of from there went into um, tech doc services did tech doc for a whole bunch of things aerospace automotive defense nuclear power so forth over the years um, until I moved to the states about uh, 25 years ago when I sort of switched over to the software side of the business and from there I've sort of bounced my career sort of been bouncing backwards and forwards between working for um, either a software vendor or being actually a practitioner at a major organization running either technical documentation and probably for the last 15 years or so more around content marketing uh, and content on the marketing side, which is where I presently sit. But throughout it all, I've always been connected, either reporting to or connected to or working alongside people that are involved with customer experience. Um, and I've sort of become a more and more vo vocal customer experience advocate over the years. Um, and sort of that's really become my focus um, really in the last five or so years is, is really around um, customer customer experience. My, my wife is actually God bless her. She, she's got to the point where she hates going shopping with me because any bad shopping experience is like, oh, oh there's a blog post. I know story. Yeah, I know story. I'm guilty of that too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Alan, so, uh, you have customer experience. You've got a new book out called The CX Trinity. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and uh, what you're hoping to achieve with this book? Yeah, certainly. Um, as you mentioned, and uh, thank you for putting it on screen, the new book uh, came, just came out earlier this year, CX Trinity, Customers, Content and Context. Um, what it is, as the subtitle says at the beginning, is really my sort of musings and observations on how the customer experience is evolving. And the way I did that was actually to go back and look at the last five or so years of those blogs that I just mentioned um, and really pull out what I thought was like 52 of the best blogs that spoke to those three areas, customers, content, and context, and then tried to bring them to uh, sort of do a forward and afterward of how that all brings together. I totally cribbed the idea of using 52 chapters from you, Scott. Um, <laughs> That's okay. It's a really good idea. And it's also a good read. I can tell you because I'm reading it myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea being that you could actually read, you could either, you know, go front to back traditionally, or you could actually jump just around. read an article, jump middle. around, or you can just take an article a week. Um, that you know, they're designed to be read in 10, 15 minutes while you're having a cup of coffee once a week. And hopefully each article will just spark some ideas uh, and conversation and some thought. Um, so that was the idea behind it and the way we, we put it together. And we, we 
we updated uh, obviously some of the blog posts because some of them sort of have references to contemporary events and so forth and, and rewrote a few but generally yeah if you like it's sort of the best of the, my thoughts on customer experience over the last five or six years um, yeah, and it it's is actually good, good stuff yeah thank you I, you know, I've heard you talk about that CX Trinity too. Can you help the audience understand what you mean by that? Certainly. So, you know, CX Trinity is, as I said, is those three areas. It, it's customers. It's about really understanding who your customer is, um, understanding your customers' needs, what it is they're trying to achieve, mm. um, which I think a lot of people forget. Um, they think of customers as being a data point as opposed to an individual who's actually trying to either get an answer to something or get something done. So it's, it's about understanding right. your customers. Um, and then obviously near and dear to my heart as a content professional for 30 years is the content that we create to help those customers. Um, and for me, I think we, we put more and more emphasis on that. I think we're, we're seeing more of that. Um, but I think the missing yeah. part, a lot of things people miss is the context in which we actually deliver that content to the customer to help them solve that particular issue that yeah. made them engage with us as a brand in the first place. So, so really that's what it is. It's about knowing who the customers are, what, what it is they're trying to achieve, developing the right content for them, and then actually understanding how they want to consume that content and how we want to deliver it to them, uh, be that on a platform or on the web or whatever device they're using. Um, and uh, and he's also understanding wider contexts such as culture, language, geography, um, and so forth. So, yeah. You know, so Alan, I love that you've pulled together these three very important concepts and sort of bubbled them up to this idea of CX or customer experience. But let's uh -huh. just make sure that everybody's on the same page. When we say customer yeah. experience, there might be different things that come to mind. So can you just give us a brief definition of what you think of when you think of customer experience? Okay, so for me, customer experience is not a department within an organization. Um, it, it tends, it, in a lot of organizations, they'll have a customer experience um, department, which tends to be a group of folks who just deal with the customers once they've bought the product. Um, or it's part of the marketing pre-sales thing. For me, customer experience is everything that a company does. If you think about it, every interaction that you have with a brand is a customer experience, is a brand experience, is a reflection of that brand. Be that interaction, be it sales, marketing. When you buy a product, what does the invoice look like? Is it correct? Do they have your name and address right? Are they? If you if you contact that company again, do they know what you've already bought from them? Uh, if you've ever had a, sh a shipping problem, do they know about that? Um, do they know you as an individual? Um, and then you know. What's it like to actually get the product and unbox it and start using it? Um, um, so for me, you know, customer experience generally is seen as sort of a linear flow from awareness down to purchase, down to delivery. Um, but for me, customer experience is like an infinite loop that, uh, you know, uh, on one side you have sort of building the awareness uh, and, and buying the product. And then the other side you have this of using it and the interactions with the company. And if, if you get the interactions right, then hopefully you'll get folks who are uh, and engaged with a company and will actually recommend and repurchase. Um, and so it becomes sort of a, an infinite loop. So for me, what does customer experience mean? Customer experience is everything that a company does when they're interacting with somebody outside the organization. I'm actually going to put a coder on that. It's actually also to an extent what they're doing inside because sometimes companies forget their employees. Right. Uh, and they forget that their employees are other people's customers and have great customer experience outside the organization. And then they come in and expect them to deliver subpar experiences to their customers. Um, and we don't change when we walk into the office as to what our expectation of interaction is going to be. Um, so um, we have to, we have, if you deliver great internal customer experience to your employees, they'll deliver even better external customer experience. That's great too. advice. That's, yeah. that's very good advice. Absolutely. And Megan, I know, I think I jumped ahead of, of a question. So I think you still have a question left that you were going to ask Alan about personas and customer journeys. Yes. So uh, when we talk about context, of course, it's really important to understand where our customers are, what stage of the journey they're in. There's kind of a high level customer journey map. And then there's mm -hmm. these sort of individual customer journey maps that dive deeper into it. So how do those, those concepts of customer journey mapping and personas and, and, you know, other things that help us really understand our customer, how do we use those to capture this sort of contextual information 
that's required to get content delivery right. Okay. Well, I sort of two answers to that. Uh, I'll take them each in turn. So customer journey maps, um, this is going to sound very um, obvious, but it's amazing how many com companies don't do it. I think for customer journey maps, the first thing you've got to do is actually go talk to your customers. Don't be a group of people sitting around in a room saying, this is what I think our customers do, uh, because you're not going to know what your customers do. Um, they, I, I tell you, having worked in a, a variety of manufacturing companies and stuff, people will take your products and do things with them that you never designed them for. Um, they will do things in a way that your customers don't know your internal customer journey maps. They will do what they need to do to get the job done. Um, so you need to go talk to them. Just to give you an example, there was a, a, I was doing some consulting for a company who provide legal um, information in the insurance industry to insurance agents um, and insurance professionals. Um, and they had, you know, a lovely portal and everything from all the way through to, you know, you could buy all their information in nice leather band volumes and put them on the shelf behind you and never look at them. You know, um, they offered a whole range of, of ways of actually getting their information. And they had all these nice customer journey maps mapped out. And when we actually went out and sat down and talked with a whole bunch of their customers, we found that the most common way that those customers got answers to questions was that they would call their sales rep. <laughs> that and was the sales, <laughs> and, the, and the sales rep would then walk down the corridor to the office of that the SME for whichever particular legal question it was, knock on the door, ask him his question, walk back, and phone the, the client back. So actually, the, um, so their customer journey was actually nothing like they had it mapped out. And in fact, the, the actual key point of their customer journey maps was their sales reps, um, at which wow. they had no visibility to. Um, so, like I said, you, it's no good sitting in a room and thinking about what people are going to do. And I also find a lot of companies I've talked to, their idea of journey mapping is what's the journey when somebody gets on our website? That's right. Why yeah. do they come to our website? Where do they go across our website? And why do they leave their website? And that's yeah. where they start and where they end their journey maps. And it's like, right. no, people are doing things beforehand. Like I said, they've got a problem. They want to pay a bill. They want to do a yeah. transaction. They want to buy something. They want to and answer that's why they come to your website you need to understand that part first and then you need to understand what they do once you've left your website with that information um, and you may be missing points before and after where you could actually engage with clients as well um, so I think I've told this story before of a uh, when I was involved in a customer journey mapping exercise where um, the customers were interacting with the co the company reckoned our customers were interacting like eight times during a particular exercise like a daily routine that the customers were reaching out at eight different points during a typical day um, but when they actually sat down we actually sat down and we interviewed 150 customers we actually found out that that task daily task there was actually 32 distinct steps and they were only interacting with this company on eight occasions so just by creating a little bit more content, we actually up that eight to 16 times. So they were interacting with the company for 50% of the day instead of 25% of the day, which gave them much better relationship, gave them the answers and actually wow. increased, increased revenue um, because people were more engaged in it with the company and more aware of what the company was doing. And they were providing answers before things went wrong, you know, providing information before things went wrong. So, so for customer journey maps, um, go talk to your customers, don't sit in a room. Um, and think about it. And it's not just about what people do once they're engaged with you. It's what they do before and what they do afterwards. And that, again, is going back to this idea of thinking about customer experience as a holistic right. experience from the customer's perspective. I'm going to take What's a really interesting, <laughs> Alan, is your, your example was about increasing the engagement with the customer. Right. But we know that a lot of times content is there and we think it's to decrease engagement with the customer oh. when it's really not, right? It, you're yeah, still... Yeah engaging with the customer, you're just doing it through content or some sort of self-service as opposed to human to human. Right? Uh, and build, yeah, I'm building the relationship. It becomes a two-way, we were just talking about it before we went on, on air. It becomes a two-way process, okay? It's not just us throwing mm -hmm. stuff out there in the hope that somebody's gonna read it or engage with it. Um, it becomes, it does build that relationship. But I will say one of the things that I absolutely hate is when I go into an organization and they say, oh, we've." We've put this website up to deflect the customer away from right, customer support. Right. Call deflection. <laughs> yeah, call yeah. deflection. And I, I hate that phrase I, yeah. because what you're actually doing is moving the problem that the customer has from a 
person to person relationship where somebody could actually build an, an engagement to another, you're basically throwing it over the wall to another department, which is the customer itself. And you're not necessarily solving the problem. Um, right. So I, I did a, some an engagement with a, a finance company who I also happen to be a customer of. Um, and I was in there and they were telling me very proudly that they'd uh, reduced their call center times by, I think it was 30%. And you know people were coming to this particular page on the website and were on and off that page within about 20 seconds. So their content must be good. And I was like, <laughs> that's not evidence. <laughs> that's not one. That's not evidence. You, you're measuring it on click rates and time on page. That just says right. nothing about the actual content. Right. I said, and I'm a customer and I've tried to use that process. And I'll tell you why they're on that page for 20 seconds, because it's rubbish and it doesn't <laughs> answer the question. And they just get frustrated and leave and go somewhere else, which is exactly what I did. And I sat there and I walked them through the process. I said, okay, this is what I was trying to do. And this is the steps that I took. I said, if I could have got somebody on the end of the phone or on a ch chat bot, I'd have solved that. And I wouldn't be stood up here telling you what a bad experience you had. I'd be saying what a great experience it was. Um, right. So, you know, just don't assume because somebody spends a short amount of time with your content, you've got good content. Um, yeah. So, so I, I want to make sure we kind of went back and forth on this a little bit. So, um, yeah. We want to make sure that so case deflection is important when it comes to reducing the amount of time customers have to come to your your agents for super easy things that chatbots yeah. or content could right. cover, right? So yeah. changing your password. If you had to contact somebody every time you had to change your password, how right. annoying would that be, right? Exactly. So right. when yeah. we think of these sort of <laughs> tier one cases, we want to be able to sort of get rid of those, right. but we do it not just to deflect total cases. We want to deflect tier one cases so that our agents have time to spend more time on tier three cases, right? right. Or however right. you level Yeah, your, so I, I think my biggest case. issue is with the term um, deflection. <laughs> deflection and customer deflection. Yeah. Because to me, that says, I don't care. I'm just, I just, I'm a smooth, I, I want to hit a me me metric here and I'm moving people away so I can hit that metric. Mm -hmm. And, and to be honest, if, if it should it, be it's like not the customer, they're trying to deflect. It's the cost yeah. of unnecessary work. That's what they're trying to deflect. yeah, kind of deflect. Yeah, right. Um, so it should you know, be something about increase answers via self serve as opposed yeah, or, to right, like, uh, cases. Positive. Right. I see what you're or, saying. Or okay, yeah. uh, a, a resolution if effectiveness, or you know right. something. Yes. Yeah, effective if you resolution skip, without a face-to-face -face case. That would be if you, if you if you say you know customer deflection that immediately sets up the wrong mental picture of what it is yeah. that you're trying right. to do. Do people actually say customer deflection? Oh yeah, I've heard customer yeah. deflection a lot. Really? Yeah. 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 Oh, that that yeah, that's not right. I, don't I mean, I can see case do. deflection, tier one case deflection, that kind of thing, but not customer deflection. Yeah. I yeah, and what you're actually trying to do is make things more efficient for the customer, and that's the that's how you should be messaging it, not we're trying to deflect the I, customer. I can give you a quick example. Yesterday, I had to go to the Apple Store, and I was uh, upgrading my phone from one version to another version, and I made my transaction online, but I had some questions about. Um, some things I couldn't find on the website. So I called support, they answered my question, and then they queued up a um, QR code for me and sent it to me via email and said, when you go to the store, just show the phone with the QR code. So I do, they check me in immediately. Somebody runs up, give me my merchandise. I'm out of the store in less than three minutes, like in and out. Nice. <laughs> Not a problem at all, it was fabulous. But the woman behind me, she was also trying to follow the directions. So the guy goes, well, I need to see your QR code. And she says, well, the reason I'm here is because my phone is broken. I can't, <laughs> it, I, can't, I can't take a picture of the QR code and show you the resulting data. You have to look me up a different way. And he said, you know what? We've learned this, but we didn't, we didn't have that information at first. So we've been pushing it back to the retail people so that when they talk to you on the phone, they might ask you, what's the problem with your phone before they send you a QR code? Because if you can't use your camera, you can't use the QR code. And so they right. got that back into the system, he said, and then now they're starting to see less and less and less of that. But it, they didn't have a way to bring in-store customer experience back to the people who created the content, but they're starting to have that loop now where they can right. communicate. Which is and that's part of the thing we were just talk, you know, talking about context. That's a context clue. Is yes. You know, why do people come in? Because their phones are broken. So why are you sending them stuff on their phone? Um, just to give right. a, a simple example, my wife and I were in a, in a doctor's office the other day and they've changed their billing system. And they were saying, 
to literally everybody that was coming in, we just changed our billing system. We're just going to send you information by a text. And probably 50% of the people in that room were older, retired yep. folks. We're and nearly every, nearly every one of them was like, I don't do text. I want a phone call. And they were yeah. like, well, we can only send text. And it's like, you've just alienated 50% right. of, the, uh, of your customers wow. potentially. Yeah. Because you're letting your systems drive the experience instead of letting the right. Yeah, and the customer needs to drive the system. I think tradition too, right? They're accustomed to. Yeah, this is how a, a medical office or an eye doctor works, and right. uh, the doctor decides, the practice decides, then the minions, right? The the people who sit at the desk, they just implement the rule. They go, well, this is what we're told to do. We give you this, and if you can't do it, I don't have a plan B for that because I'm just the reception person. I'm not the customer experience person, <laughs> right? At yeah. my eye doctor, they gave me a clipboard, right, with a, a form I needed to fill out to declare all the healthcare things the doctor might need to know about before they do right. my vision test. But they gave it to me in teeny tiny four point type. So I, of course, said to the woman behind the counter, You realize I'm here because I can't see? <laughs> and yeah. she gave me this piece of paper with all this stuff I can't see. And she's like, Oh, you're going to need to talk to the doctor about that. So I go to the doctor yeah. and he says, Oh, uh, I heard that you uh, discovered a challenge that we have with our uh, information. What do you do for a living? And I told him, and he goes, oh, well, then hold on. While that situation might suck, wait till you see what they did on our website. And he whips out <laughs> <laughs> and he shows me that they created the ability for customers to set their own point size for their display of their content. So when they log in, the website changes to reflect their eye problems. So you can actually say, here's my prescription. Oh, that's nice. And it makes that's the cool. bigger. That was that's a super nice. great example. Yeah. He, he never thought he would need to be involved in this, but now he's like, you know, it's part of the yeah. experience and I don't want people coming in here mad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, exactly. it's really interesting to think about customer experience when it comes to the medical practice, because these folks are not, they go to med school, right? Like right. Yeah, they're yeah, super yeah. smart. But they're not always thinking like us average folks who didn't go to med school, right? And so, and even the the administrators, my husband went to a, a doctor once and he had a form that he had filled out and he had a digital, he had it on his phone. And so he went up and he was like, okay, I have my form on my phone. She's like, well, I need it. And okay, well, how can I email it to you, text it to you? Oh no, you have to print it. Well, yeah. what are you going to do with it when I print it? Well, then I have to scan it. Yeah, I'm right. like, so he's like, so you need a digital copy on your computer. I have a digital copy here. And you can't think of a way to, to make this yeah, interchange exactly. without me printing it and you scanning it. Like, what's wrong with this picture? So that's, well, that's partly regulations. That's partly HIPAA. Um, but it might uh, be. Yeah. But that, there certainly are ways that yeah, it could yeah. happen. Right. Like I do. Yeah. it with. Oh, no, I, I my 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 yeah. uh, my, my current uh, current uh, employee uh, employer, the, the, uh, the health benefits we get with that, we don't get a physical health card we just have a digital Great. one that's on my phone you have right? the app yep yeah have the app and they never they don't send you a physical one um so you go in the office and of course what's the first thing the doctor wants to the receptionist wants to do she wants to take your card and put it in that little scanning machine that they've got <laughs> yes <laughs> well that's yes. once again we're exactly. just solving, solving the wrong problem anyway we're, we're, yeah but yeah. Uh, but that all of that sort of stuff is again that whole overall context the brand experience and thinking through that everything that you do is a touch point with the brand now, I, I actually want to get on my other soapbox because you mentioned personas. Yes, that's okay. where we were going to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Um, I think personas, as we think about them today and use them particularly within marketing, are a complete waste of time. Um, and let me explain that a bit more because I am in marketing. Um, and, but uh, we, we tend to, again, it comes down to, it tends to end up with a bunch of people sitting in a room saying, these are the personas that we think our customers are. Um, and they go off and spend all this time creating fictional characters and people and backstories. Um, one of the essays in, in the book is about, I was at a conference and a lady stood up at this uh, marketing conference and very proudly talked about how they'd spent two days finding the perfect kitten pro picture for the persona for the person. <laughs> they were trying to, um, I've done that before. Um, and to me, but that, that was for a food company. And basically what she was talking about was they were creating a persona for a customer who maybe had, had a, a fixed income and was working a couple of jobs and had maybe 30 minutes a day, um, you know, to, to make a meal. 
So they created this whole thing of this lady who had a four-year-old kid and a kitten and had these two jobs. And it was great if you were writing a novel about this person. Um, right. But I, I, I'm the annoying person. I stood up at the question time and said, that's great. But what happens if you were a 45-year-old guy who is also working a couple of, you know, you're a single dad or with a 45-year-old guy, or you're just somebody who's actually a very busy professional and you don't have time in the day or you schedule your day so you only have 30 minutes to make meals. I said, what your persona is, is somebody with a fixed budget who has 30 minutes to make a meal. Right. That's your persona. That box is your persona. Because if you focus down onto it's a, it's a you know, it's a single mom with a four-year-old kid and a kitten called Fluffy. Each time you do that, you're narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. And what you're actually doing is you're excluding more and more and more right. of your target market. Mm -hmm. So what would your advice be yeah. then? If some, if so uh, so seen, to me, I think persona yeah. should be built around not an indiv not a person and what a person is or whatever, but it's around those two things we, I keep coming back to, needs and tasks. Right. What does somebody need? What does that persona need? And what is it that that persona is trying to do? So for me, a persona is a ta should, should be a task driven persona, not a. That's very like interesting. scenarios. Yeah. 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 You know, this is interesting because I, I just took a, I just finished a course that was fascinating. And the the professor had us do this this um, exercise where everybody was virtual, but it, everybody got online and, and went through these different personas. There were three personas. One was a teenage girl. One was a mom of, say, three or four kids. And the other one was a businessman. Right. And so they had us decide if we're a cell phone company trying to sell this very specific package that has to do with cameras. Right. So it's it's about it was back in the day of like cameras were just coming onto smartphones. So if we're trying to sell that, which persona would we target? And so everybody chose a different thing. Right. And I, uh -huh. of course, chose the mom because I am a mom of four. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, I take all kinds of pictures. So we should target me. Right. Because and, you bring in you, your own you bring in your own assumptions. You bring in your own biases. Right. Yeah. And so then there yeah. were people that have teenage daughters and they're like, well, obviously it's the teenage girl. Right. And so you, we brought in our own biases and we had like we were very sure that those were the right personas. But then they they switched it and they used AI segmentation. So instead of having personas, they had, like you said, the tasks, the needs, all of this stuff laid out, and they put them in cohorts according to tasks and needs. And when they did that, they had, I think, eight different cohorts. Almost everybody chose cohort one. Like it was right. so obvious. And yeah. they didn't, It you know, they had moms in there and they had teenage girls and they had businessmen and they had everything inside that cohort but they focused on the needs of the individual. Yeah. And so it was just, a, it was really an eye opener in terms of why personas, I'm a big believer that personas are good for education for internal use. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, to target specifically to a persona yeah. is probably well, not, not the they most. They may important. not be the secret tool that helps us personalize at the individual level. They may be a stepping stone to trying to more, yes. yeah, yes. you agree, like to try to get closer to the customer without yeah. alienating yeah. anyone. They, they yes. can be a great way, as we said at the, right at the beginning, of understanding the customer, but understanding the customer is about understanding the needs and the tasks. It's not understanding, you know, that. Yeah. You know, the CIO right. likes to play golf every Wednesday. Right. Unless you're the sales guy trying to set up a meeting on the golf course on a Wednesday, that doesn't really right. mean much, you know? Um, yeah. So. It's like a great time, Megan, for you to tell our audience a little bit about the sponsor of today's show, Zoom and Software, and how it actually relates to helping provide contextually relevant content. Yes, absolutely. So Zoomin's platform ingests technical product content from any source, whether it's structured, unstructured, it doesn't matter, however it was created or published, and we deliver it into a modern and user-friendly doc portal, we deliver it into your community, we deliver it inside your customer service site, and even into your product itself. And so in this way, we help you present the right content according to the appropriate context and to create the optimal customer experience for your customers. 
Excellent. And you can learn more about Zoom in software by checking out the attachments section of your webinar viewing panel. There's some links there that take you directly into some content provided by the company. And you can request a demonstration at any time going to the zoominsoftware.com website. And I encourage you to do so. All right. So here's a comment before we jump into the rest of the questions. We've got three or four questions left and some questions from the audience. If you're an audience member and you'd like to ask a question, you can do so right now by clicking the ask a question tab located underneath your webinar viewing panel and texting a question into us. First, a comment about the single mom persona. Uh, someone had just shared, because they are a mom of a toddler, that if that single mom persona has a four-year-old and a kitten, they need more than 30 minutes to make that move <laughs> anyway. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or I'm if totally that agree. kid is yeah. six-year-old and wants to help, then yeah. you need at least an hour. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah I've got, I got four to six-year-old grandkids, so I, yeah. I, I, I <laughs> Isn't that a great example, though? That's something that's a real human being thing that we probably wouldn't have thought about in the marketing meeting unless we were part of that persona group. Like Megan said, right. you know, because I'm a child, yeah. a, a mother of children, I see the photo thing. But maybe when Megan's children are teenagers, she may see that they are in charge of photos now and that yeah. and, and see it kind of differently. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and that is actually talking to the customer experience. That is actually one of the biggest pitfalls is we all bring our own biases and assumptions. Um, and they're not, you know, they're not just things that reflect our day-to-day -day lives. Like you said, you right. know, you're, um, I'm, a, I'm a grandparent, which has completely changed our lives and the way we work and stuff like that. You know, um, you, bring, you bring those, you bring the, you know, the biases of where you live, you bring the cultural biases of your, of your background. One of the biggest problems that we have from a customer experience, particularly large enterprises who operate on a global scale is mm -hmm. techno technology bias. Um, you mentioned about, you know, uh, and we both talked about it, doing things on our cell phones. Right. Um, you know, there are large parts of the world that are still not connected to the Internet, um, you know, or there are parts of the world which jumped from nothing to the phone. Yet I've seen companies say, well, you've got to log into our website on, you know, on a desktop. And literally there are whole cultures that have never had desktops. They've literally right. gone right. straight to the phone. Um, that, you know, there, I, you know, I've worked with them. Um, things where people have in the tech dot world where they've had to take that technical information and they can go and work on equipment in the middle of the Amazon jungle. It's no good telling them that they just have to go and log on to the website or take an iPad with them. That's got it, you know, unless they've got a satellite and stuff like that. I mean, you and, know, electricity. The, and electricity <laughs> and stuff. No, like, electricity. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. There are sometimes no when they actually do need yeah. a printed document stuffed in the back of their overalls, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. So, so, Alan, with the unfortunately, time we bring a lot of those assumptions with them with us because somebody in the IT department says, I'm just going to give another example. Um, with everything that went on in the last 12 months, my wife works for local government. For the last 18 months, she's been working from home. That IT department had no clue about people working from home because all their systems were set up for people being in a hardwired office. Of course. Yes. And they gave her a laptop that had didn't have a functioning camera or microphone and had actually been locked so she couldn't use them. And then she was expected to participate on Zoom meetings. That ought to have been challenging. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know. Um, that must fact, be happening it, it, with the fact, gallery the only trying way she, to get a permit from right now because we're trying to fact, get a the, permit on this tiny little deck and we just cannot get it because they're working from home. Yeah. So, but the interesting thing is over the 12 months, they figured out they can do 75% of the, of the county's business with people working from home. Interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, has taught us lots of lessons. And you know, speaking has, of that, but, but again, it was just, but you know, we built, we, we built a lot of systems with our own assumptions that everybody has the same capabilities that we do and everybody has the same access to technology that we do. And right. if you're looking, if, if you're delivering to a broader market, that is often not the case. And we've got to really take a step back and think about the, the lowest common denominator. And how do we service that? How, how do you get a QR code for when you, to fix your phone when your phone broke. Yeah. 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 You know, exactly. yeah. Well, let's, let's segue yeah. then because you talked to us uh, earlier in our planning call. We were trying to figure out what we were going to talk about today. Um, that there were two viewpoints of context that you thought were important. One was the company point of view, and the other was the consumer's point of view. What do you mean by that? Well, they're, they're sort of related. They're sort of mirror reflections of each other, I think. Um, they both come back to a word I've used several times, which is relationships. It's about building relationships. And good customer experience from a customer point of view is building a relationship with a brand or a company where you feel happy to share information with them. Sure. Um, 
you like the product, you'll probably buy the product again um, because you've had good service, you've had yeah. good in, uh, interactions. Um, I'm going to go off and tell a, tell another story now. Um, <laughs> so um, last year we bought some new patio furniture um, mm. and it all turned up nicely except the patio table never turned up, the chairs turned up, the sofas turned up, um, yeah. but the table never turned up. Um, and I ended up calling the help help desk three or four times, and all I got was, oh, well, it, it, we think it's with the shipping company. So I eventually found out who the shipping company was, did a bit of online research, found out their cult phone number. I called them, and they were like, no, we never got it. And there was a lot of finger pointing. It was like, well, they've got it, they've got it, they've got it. Nobody was doing anything. So I went on LinkedIn, and I found out, found the name of somebody whose actual job title was vice president of customer experience for that company so i sent them a message on linkedin nothing no response mm. so i emailed the c i found the email for the ceo i emailed the ceo and said by the way i've just written this article on cms wire about how bad your customer experience is and my missing table <laughs> can you do anything about it no response that's so crazy um so so do you think my experience and relationship with that brand is good anymore no no uh but at the end of it i did actually find somebody on the help desk who was helpful and uh, and gave me a refund and said you know i'm not actually really meant to give you a refund i'm meant to actually tell you that you should just wait and order it again next year but i'm going to tell you now we're not going to stock it next year therefore i'm going to give you a refund um so once yeah. we got the refund we went to a competitive um company down the road and walked in and said look we bought all this patio furniture. We got everything. We didn't buy it from you. We've got everything except the table. Here's a photograph of it. Can you find us a table that is a close match? And the guy walked onto the shop floor and said, that one. And we looked at it and said, yeah, that's great. I said, can we order it? He said, yeah, you can order it, but it'll be about three weeks. I'm like, that's, it's been six months. Three weeks is not going to make a lot of <laughs> And he said, no, no. He said, go on, order it on the, on the app. He said, you'll have it tomorrow. Oh, wow. Did. Yeah. Um, so you know what's interesting so, here. So you know my 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 relationship with those two companies did a complete 180. And yeah. I've never gone back to the first one. So from a customer point of view it's about building a relationship where you trust the company that you'll give them that your data because you build that good relationship. Uh, they're good to you, they understand you, they know what you buy. Um they deliver good products, they deliver it in a nice way. You like the ethics of the company, you like what they stand for, you like the way they do business. Again, it's about building that relationship. From a business yeah. point of view, it's about building the relationship so that customer will continue to engage, will become a brand advocate, and will continue to buy and recommend. So it it's the same thing, but it's a slightly different viewpoint. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. It totally does. I want to I want to sort of key in onto something and and half answer answer a question that the audience asked. So an audience member asked about the frontline folks and how we sort of recognize them um, and the importance of them in creating yeah. that trust that you're talking about. But I also like they also mentioned training, and so of course knowledge comes to mind, right? And so we use yeah. training and content and self service and all these things to to also empower employees. So right. can you talk yeah. a little bit about how a company needs to use knowledge or content in order to train their employees to build that trust? That's yeah, I think that's what, what I said at the beginning, the first customer that you should mm -hmm. be thinking about is your employees. Yeah. Um, and building a good customer experience for your employees. You know, you can't expect your employees to be using outdated systems and outdated information. <clears throat> so again, it comes down to building a good knowledge base, mm -hmm. making sure that the content flows across what I call the digital supply chain. So that, you know, when people are building products and deciding to ship product and market sh product, you know, how many times have you seen a marketing campaign <laughs> and you go into the store and say, I want that. And they're like, I know nothing about that. Yeah. Uh, um, exactly. You know, the disconnect is apparent. <laughs> a disconnect is huge. Yeah. So, you know, you, you've got to start thinking about not breaking down those functional silos with content, but move, bridging those functional silos with content and letting the content move across those bridges. Um, 
So, you know, creating content that has the right metadata around it. So, you know, if it is a, an image of a, sh a shirt, you know what marketing campaign, you know, the, the guy on the front desk, when he pulls up the SKU on, do we have it in stock? It says this was used in the autumn marketing campaign. Or, you know, um, this, you know this, this, is, this is sold in these particular regions. Or, so they have that information at hand. Um, unfortunately, what tends to happen is stuff gets thrown over the wall, gets thrown over the wall, gets thrown over the wall. There's a, there's a time lag with that, and information gets lost along the way. So it really comes down to thinking, uh, my yeah. favorite word, holistic. Thinking about your content as a, as a holistic thing. And at each point you create content, think about what is yeah. it that's feeding my content? Where's that information coming from? And then what, where is my content being used when I finished with it? And how can I make that process better uh, and flow things right the way through? Um, so, yeah, I, I spend a lot of my time these days talking about the, this idea of the digital, digital supply chain. You've got to really think about content as being at the center of that digital supply chain, literally from when yeah. somebody has an idea about a product to when it's in the stores or on the e-commerce site or on somebody at the help desk has, has got the, the right information. All right, we are um, we are running short to time. Up. We are running Sorry, short I'll shut up. <laughs> to, to give the audience as much value as possible. Megan's got a question for you, and then we'll jump over to the audience questions. Thank you, by the way, to the audience members who are participating in the Q and A. We appreciate it, and we see your questions. Okay. All right. Um, so I think I'm just going to go right to the audience question because there's a particularly interesting awesome. one that is relevant to something I just wrote about. So it says. <laughs> Alan, have you found specific ways to measure content efficacy that are particularly useful? We uh, measure content CSAT and customer effort score via um, Medallia surveys on our website, but are looking for better ways or approaches to benchmark that we're not missing important touch points, context, et cetera. And that's from Alan Grow. Oh, bro. <laughs> Great question. Great question. I don't want to have one off the top of my head. Again, it comes down to, um, Talking to the customers, understanding the customers, giving the customers the opportunity to feedback, to give feedback. I, I found one of the best uh, things is um, putting document, putting your documentation out there, putting your content out there. Um, I know one of the companies I work for, we we put all our documentation out on a wiki. I know a lot of people have sort of the hives when you mention wikis because they think people just go in and change them, but you can lock them so you know people can read the content and maybe just make comments below um, or comment on it. Um, we found that was great. People would give us feedback on it all the time. Um, just being transparent, open. Um, I've you know seen companies that have what they call a, a you know open kitchen philosophy where li literally everything is transparent and give, give people the opportunity to, to provide feedback. Um, I think it's really around establishing that feedback loop, and then you'll find out what is used um, useful and what isn't. Um, actually, using your own content to to do something, um, I, I'm a big advocate of. You should always, you know, try your own stuff. You know, if you work for a company that sells as a product, go online and buy your own product. Um, see what that process is like. Um, think up a scenario where you've got a pro an issue. Um, and see what it takes to get it solved and walk through the process. Call you 1-800-9 and see what response you get, you know? Um, <laughs> it's always revealing when I've done that with clients. They, they're like, yeah, oh, I didn't know they said that. Yeah. I'm like, You're not in that department, but now you know. So yeah, I mean, actually, actually, this week I'm actually after this I'm going straight back to it. I'm attending a, CX, a virtual uh, conference on CX, and and one of the things that the uh, the keynote speaker was said, oh, we're going to make July the thirteenth CX day when we're going to get all these CEOs to call in their own company. I'm like, well, you've just told everybody what day it's going to be. <laughs> now they know exactly. So now they know. So it's not going to be a real experience, and that's something a CEO should be just doing at random on a semi regular basis. Sure. Or any, anybody in a. Yeah. They should be just calling in and finding out. Um, and I'm going to go right back to my uh, aerospace days. And, and I know not everybody's going to do this, but when we were writing technical docu documentation for planes, one of the things I introduced was the idea of actually on aircraft verification, where I would send two tech authors down to the production line. They were like, you know, they went to the yeah. south of France for two weeks. Um, so they loved it. But, you know, and sit on the production line with the documentation and literally see if you could actually do what we'd written about. And yeah. we found all sorts of problems yeah. Uh, yeah. about uh, and issues with the content because we were working off engineering drawings in isolation as opposed to actually seeing the physical product. 
Um, so we've got, a, we've got a question about that, Alan. That this person says that they love your comment. Don't sit in a room. Go talk with the customers, which is what the point you're trying to make there. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the problem of complex content and disrupting customer ease of use? For example, those calls are often generated because people don't understand the information they're trying to read. Yeah. Um, keep it simple. Um, I was a big proponent and an early uh, uh, developer of uh, simplified technical English. Um, oh, yeah, of course. Um, I was involved in that in, in its very early stages. Um, so I'm a big proponent of that. You know, keep keep a simple vocabulary. You're not writing the great American novel. Uh, you know, if you want right. to be in te <laughs> technical documentation to write the great American novel, do it at the... You know, do it. Yeah, that could be your hobby. Do it. Right. Every, yeah, or your second business or whatever. You know, I write outside of work. Um, you yes. know, I write a lot of fiction, but I don't do it at work. Um, you know, keep it simple. Use the same language. Develop a taxonomy across the organization. So, you know, everybody in the organization is calling the same thing by the same name. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that the one thing I'm actually going to name names now. Um, so for a while, I worked for Caterpillar, the, uh, the construction equipment manufacturer. When I arrived at Caterpillar, if you Googled the word bulldozer, Caterpillar did not come up. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good. Because all. nobody at Caterpillar calls it a bulldozer because that's not, not its technical name. Exactly. Okay. Right. It's an excavator or it's a backhoe or it's a skid steer. Those those things have a whole variety of technical names, and that's what they were called on the website. They're still called that on the website, but in the metadata, it now says bulldozer. So if you search for it, it comes up. Find it, yeah because that's what the customers call it. So, you know, f f develop a taxonomy, develop a common language, keep it simple, keep it short, use the words that your customers use, not the words that you use, is probably my number yeah. one piece of advice, okay? Um, uh, and yeah, you're not, you're not there to write the great American novel, like I say, you're right. there to help the right. customers. Keep it, keep it simple, keep it clear, keep it in distinct steps, distinct tasks, f use modular data, you know, everything should be able to be consumed, understood on its own, and link to other things. So, um, yeah, nice. that could that could so, be a whole other conversation. So. <laughs> yes, to kind of tie what you answered around the the CSAT scores as well as that, I actually just wrote an article and posted on LinkedIn about about these things. I did a lot of research at at a very large retailer I used to work for. And uh -huh. we went through in painstaking detail to clear out the language and to make it really user friendly and to get rid of legalese. What we found was that when talking about specifically policies, right, because th these were our lowest ranking CSAT scores, uh -huh. when looking at policies, we were able to make them more customer friendly, which is a really good thing. But they're overarching what they call the HMD, which is really just a CSAT score on all of their content. So if you looked at the CSAT score for all of the policy content, the clearer we made it, the lower the score went. And the reason was because people didn't like the policies, right? right. And so you need to make sure when you're looking at content that you're understanding, are they disagreeing with the content, the way it's written, or are they disagreeing with what it's right, what you're writing about you're saying, right. or something else, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's it's really, yeah, and, and really again, hard to, to sort of, home in on that, but if you can home in on that, then you can have a better understanding. Uh, and the thing to be aware of things like uh, CSAT SAT scores, uh, uh, net promoter scores and things like that is they are tend to be measuring one specific part of that overall holistic experience. Right. Yes. Um, so you could, be missing, you, 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 you could be missing something <laughs> because people are, oh, look, we've got an eight here and a nine here yeah. and an eight here and a nine here and down yeah. here you've got a two. Um, but we've, our average is like 7.6. So we're doing good. Exactly. But, right. But they yeah. And my point not. was, it's you better gotta, to take these like thumbs up, thumbs down or whatever star rating you have in your content, look at the lowest ones and then yeah. attack those. Yes. Don't take an overarching score yeah. and yeah. say, yeah. we're going to drive this score up because yeah. it's, it's a, it's just not a helpful number. Like no, being no... be measured on being measured on clicks and thumbs up and things like that. KPIs really doesn't drive the best behavior. You've got to focus right. in, on on where the issues yeah. are. Yeah. So One use more... the ratings for what they're meant for and what they're good for. They are important to get, yeah. but you have to use them in a way that's effective, right. not it's try and right. It's a snapshot of that particular moment in time. Right. Example, right. I got a phone call yesterday from an air conditioning person. And because we're content people, I recognized a pattern. She said, 
oh, hello. I was just calling to check on the service that you had the other day. And I thought, oh, well, that's great. Um, it was good. Uh, my air conditioning is working. Thank you. And she said, oh, okay. Like, uh, how likely would you be to recommend a <laughs> yeah. on a scale of one to 10? And I was like, am I doing what I think I'm doing right now? <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't have the digital equivalent. So they used the telephone. And, but yeah, you could see before after. They just wanted to know how was it, how was the experience. And yeah. she said, if you had anything that you can improve, which was not normally on the those uh, net promoter scores, what would you do? And I said, I would put this online and let me do it online, so you don't have to waste your time calling me and asking me. Because <laughs> if I was unhappy, I would have already called you. Yeah, yeah, yeah which funny. actually brings up, brings up the point I wanted to make. The thing about those is you made a good point, Scott. They're historical. Okay, they're about what happened. Right. In they the also in the past, and they're not about why something happened. They're about what did happen. So you've got no idea about why it happened. Right. Um, and the other thing is um, they're self-selecting. People only fill in surveys and give thumbs yeah. up, thumbs down if they're either very happy or very or unhappy. More you often miss, very unhappy. <laughs> you miss the big – and more often it's because they're unhappy. Yeah. You miss the big yeah. chunk of people in the middle who yeah. are okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's why I say use it for what it's good for. Use it as an indicator for the content that is getting lots of thumbs down. You need yeah. to dive deeper and figure out why, right? You actually have yeah. to do some work and figure out why. Thumbs up, thumbs down really is most effective, I think, when used like Netflix would use it or Pandora uses it where you're saying, yeah. yes, send me more of this or no, send me right, less yeah. of this. I don't like this. Right. That's when it's yeah. really effective. Yeah. But if you're going to put it on your content, don't think you're driving an overall score. Just look at the bottom ratings and go yeah. figure yeah. out why they're rating low. Yeah. And, and, and you just said the right thing. Right. Figure out why. Yes. Figure out yeah. why. Yes. Yes. Let's take Alan's yeah. advice, though, too. You can contact a customer that's already submitted a data to you. Right. You can yeah. say, hey, I saw that you gave us a two and I'm calling because I wondered if you had uh, uh, the situation were different. What would you want it to be like? Tell me so yeah. I can see yeah. if we can make that yes. happen. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. And actually going back to the whole relationship thing, I think what really works and where people really like it is where they actually see that that feedback drives action yes. and re gets results and they see something. Yes. from it. Because yeah. some Absolutely. of the research I've seen is, is like it's, I think it's 72 percent of the companies who collect customer data do nothing that with that. it. Yeah. Right. That is one yeah. of the biggest trust busters, too. If yes. people take the time to give to fill out a survey, even if it's just one question, if they take the time to do it and they don't see an improvement. Yeah. They, yeah, they will exactly. not trust you in the future. So, yeah. yeah. Well, we've got work true. to do. That means we'll all be busy because there's a lot of broken content out there that needs some contextual. That's very uh, true. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> in our audience members, you shall all be busy for a long time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> problems to tackle. And speaking of that, I wanted to thank you, Alan uh, Porter, for making time to be on our show today. And thanks to the audience for being here, too. We're running out of time. You've got tons of questions for Alan. So, uh, Definitely look him up on LinkedIn and check out his book because you're definitely going to want to get a copy of that. And check your inbox for our next Content Advantage show. We will meet again here in two weeks. Uh, this will be Tuesday, June 22nd, when we chat with Technical Publications Director Janice Cadell of the CG Group. And uh, look in your inbox for an invite to that show. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Yeah, I'm Definitely so don't want to miss that. We we talked a lot about feedback, so I want to make sure everyone knows that there is a rate this tab in your webinar viewing panel. Click on that. Give us a one to five star rating. I promise you we read every we single do. word <laughs> and we actually do stuff with it. So uh, your time will not be wasted. Definitely do that because we want to know what you thought of today's show. If you have ideas for what you want to see in the future, definitely add them there as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. So you've been watching the Content Advantage. Today's show has been recorded. If you're new to the platform, that means about half an hour from now, you'll get an email that reminds you that the URL that you're using to watch the show live today will turn into a recording link that you can use to share with others or watch on demand whenever you like. On behalf of myself and uh, my co-host, Megan Gahuli and Alan J. Porter, our guest, I'd like to thank you for making time to watch our show. We hope that you'll join us for the upcoming episodes. And until then, be safe, be well, and keep doing great work. Thanks again. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Ensure your customers find the answers they need with Zoomin. Bring together product content from all teams and sources to deliver a unified, personalized content experience. Check us out at www.zoominsoftware.com. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.